Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caru. If you continue to build the pipeline, your pipeline is literally dry right now. And we're going into, Olga, the slowest time of year. I want to help you double your business. And if we want to double our business, we need to be focused on the things that double our business. Why are you looking to buy? What is the purpose? What is the goal? Right? It always comes back to why they're buying. Prices are going to soften a little, 1%, 2%, something really insignificant, but enough to make a difference to, to buyers. No phone calls, no follow-up, no check-ins, nothing. Just weekly email. Continue to make a million bucks every year after that. I don't want to call people, Ricky. Well, why did you get why did you get your real estate license? The whole premise of the business is to talk to people that you don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. If you're doing the generic ones that companies send out for you, you're definitely not going to win any business out of that. So today, guys, we have our special guest, Ricky Karoub, joining us. For those who don't know, uh, Ricky Karoub is the number one agent uh, on the Gulf Coast. He's the best-selling author of two books, Zero to Diamond and List to Last. He's a real estate coach, speaker, social media influencer, Real estate investor, uh, sold over 100 houses per year as a solo agent. He's an eight-time REMAX Platinum Club member, which means your GCI had to be over a million dollars due to that eight years back-to-back. -back. He's an EXP Icon agent. Now he owns a mortgage company. Rick, we thank you for joining us this morning, and let's get this thing started, man. Go ahead and take it away. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. How are we doing? So yeah, you, you you said it all right there. Listen, I don't know how much time we have and all that good stuff. I told Mark, let's do kind of a Q&A type session. I'm sure a lot of you guys already follow me and know a lot of my stuff and what I got going on and how I feel about things. And if you don't, then you're fixing to find out when somebody asks me a question. So let, let's kind of start out with there, man. Like if somebody could unmute and maybe tell me what's going on in your business, what questions you have, what do you think I can help you with? That'll kind of give me direction to go here. And then we'll kind of take it from there. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I have a buyer who's looking into a house that is built in 1948. And it has like a major termite issue. Yeah. And best. This. I'm not sure if it's the best thing for her, you know, and you got to feel good about what you're doing as a realtor while you're selling. How do you handle that situation? How much information? I mean, I'm just telling her, listen, this is what it has. You have to make sure we do all the right inspections to make, you know, make sure that you feel good in it. Buying this at the end of the day, you know, what, where to go with it. If I should really try to discourage her from it, Olga, listen to me. We, you're not. Really bad ration. Mm. Look, you're you're not the one buying the property. Okay, they're buying the property. Doesn't matter what you think. Um, you know, you have to feel good about what you're selling. No, you don't. Um, the buyer has to feel good about what they're buying. That's not really your job to sway them. Uh, I see a lot of agents who take a situation with a buyer and because they personally wouldn't buy the property, they go and talk the buyer out of that property. Oh, you shouldn't buy that. There's no way you should buy that. When the buyer actually loves this property, for whatever reason, you may not be able to understand, but not everybody's the same. And so I see, I see agents talking buyers out of, out of deals that later on the buyer regrets not doing that deal. It's like, it's not about what you want. It's about what they want. If they love the house and they want a termite infested of a bestest house, then I got one for you. Right? Um, disclose, and you say, I don't know what to disclose to them. Disclose everything to them. Okay. Why would you hide anything from them? I mean, that kind of goes against right. what you're saying. You don't right. know if, if you should sell them this house, and then you don't know if you should disclose everything to them. Well, that kind of, that's kind of contradictive. Got it. Yep. T 
sell them everything. Well, I have disclosed. And what's that? I have disclosed everything that I've found out about it. No, that, that's fine. I'm just going based on what you said. You didn't know what to disclose, you said. Yeah. Tell them everything. Let them make a decision. If they don't want to move forward, go sell them another house. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this, Olga. How many active buyers and sellers are you working with right now currently? Um, four. Okay. That's the most common answer. Four. Do you know statistically that's 0.8 deals? So you're working on nothing. Okay. You need 15 to 20 active buyers and sellers to close one deal a week. Okay. All of your mental capacity needs to be spent on how do I find uh, 11 more people who might want to buy or sell with me in the next six months? That's where all of your focus needs to be because right now you're on track to close like one deal a month, if that, and that's if you continue to build the pipeline. Your pipeline is literally dry right now. And we're going into, Olga, the slowest time of year. And it's going to be even slower this year because of the situation with interest rates and whatnot. You're going into the slowest time of year with basically no pipeline. That's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about you. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying. That needs to be the focus. You know, you should have one phone call with this buyer and say, hey, this thing is eat up with termites and asbestos. Right? You want to buy it? Great, I'll help you. If you want to move on to something else, I'll move on to something else. That's one phone call that takes five minutes. The other seven hours and 55 minutes of your day needs to be, where can I find another buyer or seller that might want to buy or sell something with me in the next six months? Because I'm fixing to die out here because the market's about to get really slow. I want to help you double your business. And if we want to double our business... We need to be focused on the things that double our business. Right? Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I got something. So uh, there's a lot of complaints. Obviously, millennials have been complaining since the pandemic about astronomical prices, high interest rates. So even when interest rates were really low, they were just getting, you know, paid out the cash. So now yeah. inventory is still crazy low. Um, yep. uh, everywhere, but especially like our area and stuff. Um, and on top of that, interest rates continue to go up and we're telling people get on, you know, get off the fence, get in here. This isn't going to, you know, necessarily change overnight. And there's always opportunity in the market. You're, we're going into the slowest season. We've got high interest rates. We've got low inventory. We've got prices that with the high interest rate, normally we can offset it because the prices are going down. We've actually seen a 2% uptick in our prices. Mm -hmm. So how do we combat these concerns and fears with getting buyers off the fence? And how do we address this where we're showing them the opportunities of what they're, what they're really, they could be, especially looking into the future, um, and getting listings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how do we get buyers off the fence? And, and by the way, how do we get listings? And how do we get, two, yeah. Two different conversations. Uh, right. Um, well, people have interest rates, they don't want to buy because they're selling and they're like, shoot, I'm at a 3% interest rate. Why would I buy right now and sell my house? Listen, the, the. Okay, number one, you don't get buyers off the fence, right? You, your, your job is not to get them off the fence, convince them, make them do something. That's not what our job is, right? That's number one. Number two, the macro answer is give it, number one, like we're going to see softening of prices this fall as we do every single year. If you look at a graph of median home prices, it does this every year, up and down, up, down, up, down, every year, even in 2021. The year of the boom, 6 million transactions, prices were crazy, 100000 over asking price, 30 offers per listing. Even in that year, the median home prices went down in the fall. Okay, it's, it's right there black and white. It happens every single year. We're going to get some relief when it comes to home prices. I think we've peaked out in terms of mortgage rates, right? I think this is it. I think it's going to do nothing but kind of really slowly, slowly, slowly go down. It's, it may fluctuate a little bit, like it's under, it's right around seven. It may get above seven again. Like it's volatile right this second because they haven't tamed inflation. But for the, for the short-term buyers, 
like by this fall when prices drop a tad, 1%, right? The macro answer is give it a couple years because inventory will work itself out. Affordability will work itself out. Okay, we will see mortgage rates come down several points over the next two, three years, however long it takes. And we're going to get some relief when it comes to mortgage rates. Also, household median household incomes will continue to increase. That will also help with affordability. And home prices, I believe, are, are they're going to kind of be in a leveling stage, I think. I think we're going to see, you know, the normal, you know, 2 3 4% a year appreciation, you know, for a while. Um, because prices, here's the thing, prices can't continue to go up like they have because of affordability. Because of affordability, we're going to see prices level out. Um, every mi market is completely different, though. So you have to look locally, right? Super micro, hyper local uh, markets. But I'm just speaking in generalities here. Um, this fall, I think we'll see prices soften. I think we'll see a little relief with mortgage rates. Not much, but that will help a lot. A little help on prices, a little help on rates, and we, we, get, we get a lot of help. And then on the back end, over the next couple of years, this inventory thing's going to work out because when mortgage rates do slowly get back down around five, that's going to open up so many listings of existing home buyer, home sellers who have been sitting on three and four percent interest that hate their house. And every day they hate it more and more and more. That demand is building, 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 building. And when rates hit a certain number, that's going to pop. And we're going to see a lot of inventory hit the market. Also, people who are buying today at seven percent rates who want to upgrade their home in the next two to three years, they're going to be happy to list their property and buy a new property, their, their dream home at five percent. So we're going to see some relief with inventory from that perspective. Also, the baby boomers who are who are you know getting into their their older years, right? They're going to get into you know I mean they're they're like you know for a second there they were like the biggest home buying group. They even beat out millennials, and um and so we're going to see I believe a lot of inventory there, you know as that as that group um you know gets into their older years. Um, nursing homes, um, passing away, things like that. We're going to see inventory there. I, I just, over the next two, three years, we're going to see affordability get a lot better. I think we're peaked out right now, probably close to an all-time high when it comes to un unaffordability. It's probably the worst it's it's been. However, think about this. When you look at mortgage rates on an on a, on a inflation-adjusted basis going back to 1980, you see that right now, we're pretty in line with the with the 90s and the early 2000s. And I believe that we're just getting back to normal. If you look at the percentage of household income that goes towards a mortgage payment, you'll see that we're right there where we were in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. What you also see when you look at those charts is that we were absolutely spoiled over the last decade and a half with low mortgage rates and low home prices. Home prices went down 50%, whatever they went down to in your market for the first time ever in 100 years. So when you have historically low mortgage rates and historically, you know, historical event where prices also go down, you have this affordability that was amazing. And what, what happened was, is we all got used to that and we didn't know how good we had it. And we got used to that for 10 years, 12 years, and now that it's bounced back to we're above we're above normal now, but it's it's set it's going to settle out in that normal range of where we were in the '90s and the early 2000s, and we're going to kind of be back to normal. But that's a shock when we were used to what we've been used to affordability wise over the last 12 years. So, what do you tell buyers who are on the fence? I mean, it comes down to do you want to own something, and how long do you want to own it for? They did a study. You know, there's um, 11 million millennials who owned a house back in 2017, and now it's 18 and a half million millennials own homes. Um, and like 40% of those millennials say they're going to stay for 16 years. Okay, people are buying homes to live on them for a long time. You know, they're locking themselves in to these homes. They're planning on keeping these homes for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if that's the case, see, I, I think it comes back to this. Why are you looking to buy? What is the purpose? What is the goal? 
right? It always comes back to why they're buying. So a buyer says, I want to buy a home. I'm worried about rates. I'm worried about unaffordability. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. Well, let me ask you about it, Mr. Buyer. What's got you thinking about buying in the first place? Why do you want to buy? And what's the goal at the end of the day? If the reason is, hey, I'm tired of rent going up every single year and I want, I want a fixed payment. And when I buy the home, I'm going to stay there for 15 years. That's the plan. It's like, well, like when you look at home prices over the next 15 years, I mean, I would, I would fear to say there's not an economist in the world that says home prices are not going to be exponentially higher from where they are right now in 15 years. Right. It's a pretty good bet that homes are going to be worth more in 15 years. Even if they go down over the next 12 months, there's a good chance they're going to be worth a lot more than what they are today in 15 years. Right. So it just it just kind of depends on their motivation, why they're buying. And all we can do is the best we can do. And if at the end of the day they decide they want to hold off and see what happens. Awesome. I'm not trying to force you to do anything. I'm not trying to get you to jump off the fence. I'm not trying to convince you or. Or, or try to make you do do this or that. That's not my job. My job is to help you do what you are trying to do. That's it. Just trying to help you do what you want to do. Trying to educate you so you're going to make an, an informed decision. And then I'm here to help you with whatever that decision may be. Whether it's to buy, whether it's not to buy, it doesn't matter to me. Why? Because closings happen every day forever. If you don't buy, the next person is going to buy. If they don't buy, the next person is going to buy. And I'm going to do my job to talk to as many people as I can in my market to make sure I'm doing my my work as a contributing member of society to do community outreach to everyone I can to see what I can do to help them using my services as a real estate agent. Right? Um, back in when we were quarantined in, uh, in April 2020, couldn't leave our homes, I put out a video and I said, we're about to have the largest real estate surge that we've ever seen. That's when we were actually in our houses, not knowing if we were going to die from a virus or if we were going to have a job. I was predicting we would have the largest real estate surge we've ever seen. What happened? 2021 happened. We had the largest real estate surge we've seen in a long time. Maybe, maybe arguably one of the largest ones we've ever seen. In, in December last year, there's, this is this is documented. I said, we hit bottom of home prices. What happened? In January, we hit bottom for home prices. So I was a little early. Back in early May, I said, we're going to hit positive year-over-year prices this year. Not only that, we're going to go to all-time new highs. What happened? We hit positive year-over-year numbers, and we hit all-time new highs. Now I'm telling you what's going to happen in the fall. Prices are going to soften a little, 1%, 2%, something really insignificant, but enough to make a difference to, to buyers. Days of the market may increase, and mortgage rates, I believe, are going to be a little better. Maybe it goes from 7 to to 6.7 or 6.6 or 6.8, but that, that's, that makes a big difference for these buyers, right? So I would say to buyers right now, be patient, look around, but when you see something you like, get ready to pounce. No, nobody has questions. I know you guys are all burning. Come on, talk. What do you guys have a question? Yeah. What do you suggest about personal um, uh, investment right now for properties, even at this high interest rate? Like if you're buying properties to invest in? Like to slit or even rent. Yeah. For yourself, though? Or for your yeah. clients? I'm buying properties every month. Um, mostly for myself. Yeah. Mostly for myself. I mean, it's, you know, we, we would have to get a loan if we wanted to invest anyway, but, um, you know, at this high of a rate, but the house prices are a little bit higher as well. So I, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. It's just a thought in the back of my head. What you have to do is find the deals. There's always an opportunity in the market, right? I'm closing on houses every single month. Uh, I flip houses. I buy houses. I hold houses. I rent houses. I buy duplexes. I buy commercial. I buy everything. 
What am I buying right now? What opportunity did I find in the market? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, right now, I'm closing on new construction homes every month. I'm buying them. I'm renting them out. Okay, the rent is way more than the payment. Why? Why? Because when I buy through the builder and I use their mortgage company, I'm getting a 5.9 investor mortgage rate. And guess what? They're paying 5000 on my closing costs. And guess what? It's a brand new house, so I have no maintenance for five or 10 years, right? So like I found a little niche in the market where I could get a lower mortgage rate than, than the rest of the market on an investor loan. I can I found something that my 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 rent is you know six hundred to a thousand bucks over my mortgage payment, and and I don't have any maintenance, and they're gonna pay five thousand my closing costs. Sign me up, Johnny. So I think I think it comes down to finding those deals, finding those little niches, finding those little opportunities, you know, that you can capitalize on. Not every deal, you know, there. There are markets where anything you buy is, is is a deal. Anything you buy cash flows, anything you buy is going to be worth more the next day. There there are times in the market where you could just throw a rock and anything you buy is a home run. But we're not in that market right now. We're in the market where you have to be a little savvy. You have to be a little patient. You have to put in a little work to find the opportunities, right? So that's all it is. They're out there. They may They're just not around every corner. But I'm, but I'm closing on deals every month. Ricky, Josh Panute here. Hey, Josh. Uh, how you doing, son? Rocking, rocking, man. So you're, you're, you've got it down where you're able to close a hundred deals a year as a, as a single agent. That's in, insane to even really think about because most teams don't close a hundred a year. You know what I mean? They're what lazy. does that look like on a high level perspective? What does that look like? It, it's, 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 to me, it's just average. It's two deals a week. You're going to sit here and tell me two deals a week is something amazing. Then we're living on two different planets. If you're, if you're living in a world where teams don't close a hundred deals, they're living in bizarre world to me because two deals, we, we close two deals a week, literally I'm in my sleep. Like that's, that puts me to sleep. Uh, at the peak when I was in full production, and we were doing 100 deals a, uh, a year, two deals a week. I was working like 10, 15 hours a week on my real estate business. The rest of the time, I was building my personal brand, coaching, traveling, speaking, you know, writing books, doing all that stuff, right? So, Josh, when you, when you build a business around very simple, scalable systems, okay, um, I see it says, Josh, I don't know how to say your name, team, right? So you got a team, right? Okay, how many is on your team? We've got, um, I believe, six agents right now. Um, what's the lead gen activity? We we do a lot. Um, we've got Google Pay Per Click coming in. We've got um, Bing Pay Per Click coming in. We've got Ojo Op City. All that type of stuff. We've got convert monster working with us. Um, a, a bit. Got it. So I get it. And then, and then, what happens with those leads long term? How do you make sure that these leads never forget who who you are? That's part of the issue that we're running into. Got it. Is is the cracks? We you know every time we change a CRM, everything goes. I understand you know what I mean. I understand. And it's just yeah. Let me let me help you. Okay. Yeah. Will you help me help you? Absolutely. Two things, lead gen, right? And scalable systems where nobody ever forgets who you are forever. And you can snowball your business into a hundred deals a year in your sleep. Uh -huh. I can tell you exactly how to do it in a matter of minutes through experience, not theory, right? I've done this. Lead gen. Okay, I want you to think about this. I'm going to take you down. I'm taking down the rabbit hole. Every single lead gen activity comes back to the same thing, the same activity, right? Everything you do lead gen wise to get leads comes back to the same activity. What would that activity be? Talking to people. Sure, that's pretty good. Not not a hundred percent where I was going with it, but but let me tell you where I was going with it. Every single lead gen activity comes right back to 
that lead gen activity or avenue creating a list of people for you or your team or whoever to sit down and call, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so like Google pay-per-click, you get leads, somebody sits down and calls these leads. You get open house, people sign in the sign-in sheet. The next day, you sit down and call that list of people, right? Facebook ads, list of people. YouTube, list of people. Sphere of Influence, list of people. For sale by owners, list of people. Expires, list of people. It's all lists that you sit down and call, correct? Mm -hmm. Now we know that that is the activity that everything leads right back to. And that is the highest productive like lead gen activity because, in fact, every single lead gen activity comes back to that same activity, sitting down to call this list of people. So my question is, is if we know that and we know that we've got to sit down for an hour or two or three or whatever and call this list of people, okay, no matter what the lead gen activity is, then why wouldn't we spend that time sitting down calling the list of people and call the highest quality prospects available. Right? Oh. Okay. I think you're following me. Yep. So the question is, in your mind, what are the highest quality prospects available? For me? In, in, in the universe. For anybody. The ones that are actively engaging. Is the this is what I would say. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, the highest quality prospects available are property owners who buy and sell. Okay. Property owners are the highest quality buyers because they've already been there. They've done that. They know the process. They just need an agent to help them through getting whatever it is they're trying to do, right? They're, they're, they very rarely ghost you. They, they know that they, you're not educating them. They, they know the process, right? If they sell, it's a listing, which is the highest form of leverage as a real estate agent. So like in my mind, tell me if you agree, homeowners are the highest quality prospects available. Yeah. I would agree. Okay. Okay. So there's an unlimited amount of them. You can't call all of them ever in your life. Okay, so my question is, is if we got to sit down and call a list of people anyway, and that's how we get to the transactions, why aren't we calling the highest quality prospects available? Why are we spending time calling random buyer leads that came in through Google or, or Opsidy with where, where we pay 35% to them? Why, why would we even talk to or spend any time on leads that aren't the highest quality in the market? That's my first question. Okay. Opportunity. I guess I, I'm, I'm not quite following. Okay. No, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to, I'm trying to save your life. I'm trying to flip your mindset around to understand that you're doing the exact same thing. You're just calling the lowest quality prospects available. And what I want you to do is, is I want your team or whoever's making the calls to call the highest quality prospects available, right? So for example, like you can go back 10 years worth of expired, withdrawn and canceled data, 10 years worth and have tens of thousands of leads like that in a split second, email, cell phone numbers like that, okay, Alakazam. And then call them and say, hey, I see it. You were trying to sell this house at one point. Whatever happened with that? And now all of a sudden they're trying to help you figure out this mystery. And you get into this amazing conversation with a property owner who now quite possibly is going to do business with you for the rest of your life. Now, why wouldn't we talk? I mean, you could even make a career off that just expires, just 10 years worth of data that are million times higher quality than Google pay-per-click and Opsidy leads that you literally get for less than a penny a piece. What, what objections do you have for me of your team switching over to the highest quality leads possible? Exactly, bro. That's what I'm trying to tell you, man. If you'll switch all that effort from pay-per-click that costs you a million bucks, that conversion sucks and it's random buyers who run you all over the place. Look, I know a guy that, made, uh, that sold 80 million last year off YouTube, strictly YouTube. And 99% of those, le those uh, deals were buyer leads. And I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with YouTube. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on 30 listings and at 6.30 at night when I'm at home eating dinner with my family just chilling, the guy that's doing Google pay-per-click and YouTube ads and YouTube videos, they're the ones out there showing my listings. See, somebody's making money at 7 o'clock at night. It's not going to be me. I'm not going to be the one out there. I'm going to be making the money because somebody's going to be showing my listings, but I'm not going to be the one working. There's, a, there's money that's going to be made at 7 o'clock, right? And you have the uh, option whether it's going to be you or somebody else. Now, running a team's a whole different thing. Like you have buyer agents that's going to go out there and do the, do the buyer agent thing. That's cool. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to manage agents. So I'm not going to deal with that either. So how can I sell a hundred properties on my own without any buyer agents, any worry? I go to bed at night with not a, not a, no stress at all by dealing primarily only with property owners who buy and sell. And it, it creates a situation where I only show property two or three times a month. And, it, and it's people who actually buy because they just sold something and they're just rebuying. Those are the best buyers in the world. Mm -hmm. So we're, you're, you're going to sit down and make calls anyway. Why not call the highest quality prospects? On the backside, you may say, well, a YouTube video lasts forever. It's evergreen. It lasts forever. Uh, when you make a phone call, you call and that's it. Really? Because when I make a call, I'm connecting with them, giving a great first impression, getting their information, and I'm putting them on my database to do a weekly email on the same day of the week forever, and they never forget who I am. And now that's forever. And now I can scale my business, Josh, because every single person I talk to I know will never forget me because I have a simple scalable system on the back end that hits a 90% organic reach versus social media that hits a 5% organic reach. I know that when I send this email out, they're going to see it. Whether they open or not is is not up to me, but they're going to see it. I need them to see my name, right? So the foundation of your business needs to be weekly email, same day of the week forever to your entire database. And now we can scale. Now we can build a snowball where in three to five years, you don't have to prospect anymore. In 2017, that was the first year I made a million bucks. That was the, that was the year I quit prospecting altogether. No postcards, no social media, no phone calls, no follow-up, no check-ins, nothing. Just weekly email. Continue to make a million bucks every year after that. You can build this. You can build this snowball using the weekly email process, right? And then if you can be the most efficient you can be on the front end with your, with your lead gen to talk to the most efficient, highest quality prospects in the market, boom. <laughs> you give it three to five years, bro, and you could be doing 200 deals a year in your sleep because it turns into a repeat, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, past clients, you know, repeat referral and referral of referrals. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that part, people aren't interviewing three agents. They're calling one agent, you. Right? And it's just so easy at that point. Awesome. So... Like, start to transition into property owners, man, for less than a penny. Start to build the weekly email. Here, let me put this right here in the chat. This is radxdiscount.com. Start my weekly email.com right there. If you go, you can get a discount with RedX to get those expired listings. Oh my God, let me let me grab this for you too real quick. This is a training I did on expireds, how to go back 10 years worth, uh, scripts, the whole nine yards. Let me put this for you guys as well. This was a, if you guys, some of you probably saw it, but this was really, everybody needs to see that. Um, start my weekly email. You can literally see every email I sent since November. I've been doing it since 2007, but you can see every email I've sent since November right there. And also use my, my same, the same template I use. All right. That's awesome, dude. Thank you. Yeah, bro. Ricky, can you talk a little bit about your, um, about the program that you do, the coaching, all of that stuff? Cause there's a few people here. I'm sure that don't know. 
but it's pretty it's pretty stellar. Oh, let me let me stack this for you. Yeah. Uh, let's see where could I grab that? Let's see. I have a sixty day challenge, totally free. Let's see where are you? Here we go. Boom. Hundreds of thousands of agents have went through it. You know, the ones who complete the challenge say they get more listings, close more deals. 98% say they enjoy being an agent more. It really just takes the pressure off, man, because now you realize, like, it doesn't matter what the market does. If you can go out, like, I here it is. Here's the link for it. If If you can go out and create leads out of thin air, like, on the spot, like, I get it off here and, like, pick up three, I could find three leads in like the next 30 minutes, just calling it old expires. Like one year, two year old expires in my market is gold to me. Um, When you can create leads out of thin air, it doesn't matter what the market does. If you're dependent on these pay-per-click, Zillow, so on and so forth leads and the market shifts, that the, your, your, your lead flow is dependent on the market and what buyers, how the activity of buyers in the market that's not a good place to be. You're kind of susceptible to market swings. You want to build a business that doesn't matter what the market's doing. You can go out there and do deals anytime you want. You can create business out of thin air, right? So when you understand a couple things like how closings happen every day forever and you know how you can create business out of thin air no matter what, it takes a lot of pressure off. You know, it's like you don't worry so much about what the market's doing. You just go to work every day and do what you're supposed to do, you know, to get out there and build your business and kind of look long-term too, you know, like what this snowball could really turn into over time. If you do the things you're supposed to do, like for example, talk about snowballs and stuff like that. Like if you created five new friends a day, the number one reason, the, the number one way or that, that if at the end of a deal, if you said, Hey, Mr. Seller, Hey, Mr. Buyer, how did you pick your agent? The most common answer is I had a friend in the business with a great reputation, right? And that's by far. So we understand that the objective every day needs to be how many friends can I create in the market? Not how many appointments I can set. How many friends can I make that own property? And if you can create five new friends a day for 250 working days a year over the course of five years, that's 6,000 new friends or property owners in the market. If you've got 6,000 people that you made friends with that own property in the market that get a weekly email on the same day of the week forever, how big is your business? I can tell you how big your business is. It, you're probably the number one agent in your market. And all you did was create five new friends a day. That was the goal. Like, it's just things that are just literally that simple. I don't want to call people, Ricky. Well, why did you get, why did you get your real estate license? The whole premise of the business is to talk to people that you don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. So you don't want to do the thing that, it, that this business is predicated on? Then why'd you get your license? I want to do social media, okay? Go do social media. But guess what? It's going to create a list of people for you to sit down and call. You can run, but you can't hide. You're going to sit down and call a list of people. Who are the list of people going to be? I want to be the best. I don't know about you guys. I want to be the best. So I'm going to call the highest quality people if I'm calling this list. I'm not going to call the lowest quality people. That's like saying I'd rather call $100,000 property owners than million dollar property owners. That's what that's what I hear when I hear I'm getting Zillow leads. I'm getting pay per click. I'm I'm doing you're, you're, you've decided you want to call $100,000 property owners. You may get a million-dollar deal here. You're going to run all around town showing buyers all this stuff and do all these things, and that's awesome. If that's your thing? Go for it. Guess what? Every single thing works. I'm just telling you if you want to be the most efficient, grow the fastest, and have a foundation of a business that you can actually leverage, then I'm going to call the high. Uh, that's what I want. That's the only way I can, you know, Josh asked me how I close 100 deals. It's amazing. Some teams don't do that. The, the, the way that I do that is because I decided I was going to have the most efficient business ever. I'm going to call the most efficient leads. I'm going to have the most simple processes on the back end where these leads never forget who I am. That I can just simply do 15 minutes a week, weekly email. I don't care if it's 500 or 50,000. 
I'm going to touch every single one of those people within that 15 minutes I spend to build that email every week. That's simple, scalable. If my system is to text everybody, if my system is to text everybody one-on-one or call them and check on them and stuff like that, I can't scale that. If I have 5,000 people, I can't, I can't scale that. If it's not scalable, I'm not doing it. What email system do you use to send out these emails on a weekly basis? At this point, you're probably at 100 grand, like 100,000 people, right? I have uh, 20,000, 7,500 open it up every week. Wow. And um, close 100 deals a year. I don't, I don't prospect anymore. I'll put a link right here. That's the system I use. If you use that link, in about two weeks, I'm going to have week one, week two, week three, week four templates. There's already a week. They already will create you a custom template just like mine. But in a couple of weeks, we've already built it. They're just running the code. I'll have week one, week two, week three, week four templates where you can rotate these every week. Week one is stats of the week of the month. Week two is restaurant of the month. Week three is deal of the month. Week four is breaking news of the month. And then you can just rotate those every month throughout the weeks. So I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to make the weekly email idea really simple for agents to be able to execute on. Cause it's so, it's so crucial. Keith, do you use um, KV Core or do you just use constant contact? Just constant contact. I'm not going to use something a broker gives me because if that broker goes out or if they decide they don't want to use KV Core anymore, or if I leave the company, then I'm screwed. I'm no, going to have my, right? You don't What's that? You don't add notes or anything for a client. No. What do I need to remember? I remember you talked about this, so I'm not going to ask. <laughs> it like um, honestly, people like people don't care if I remember their dog's birthdays or that their mom died five years ago, right? Or their kids are going to graduate, stuff like that. I mean, if you guys can think of something that I need to remember about a client, I'm happy to listen. How long did it take you to actually get to where you're at? Like, how many emails did you start with? How quickly did you build? And how quickly did your business start going to 100 closed things a year? Um, okay. So in 2002, I got my license. I made a lot of money really quickly. I made a million bucks. I was 23 at that time. Then I lost everything in the crash. I okay, went back to roofing houses, worked on an oil rig, sleeping in my car. And then in 2008, I got back in the business and it was super easy in 2008 because things were half price. It was just so easy to sell property. There was no agents and it was like everything was half off. It was just the easiest market in the world. And um, so I just started building that way. That's when I started building the weekly email. I added a thousand um, emails that first year and I sold 20 properties. So I started with zero, of course, and then I added a thousand in that first year, and I sold twenty properties that first year. Um, by two thousand fourteen, okay, that was two thousand eight. Um, two thousand fourteen was the first year I did a hundred deals, so six years before I did a hundred deals, and then I did a hundred deals every year after that. So that's kind of, and then by the in two thousand fourteen, I was at about ten thousand emails. Now I'm at twenty thousand. That's that's a good. That's about what the timeline was. I have a quick question. What are you seeing in your weekly emails? Are you just keeping them up to date on the, the current market or are you be you're not being specific to any one person? Are you just sending out a blast email? Yeah, exactly. Where where you win with the weekly email, and this is where agents really lose with any kind of marketing, is they just send out just here's the market stats, but they don't give their opinions on what those market stats are. They say, here's a great restaurant, but they don't tell about their experience at the restaurant and to reply back to win a $50 gift card. They tell what the deal of the month is, but they don't say why they feel like it's such a good deal. And so what actually wins in any marketing and especially email is actually when you personalize it by actually taking the time to write out what your opinions are on the said subject, right? So again, uh, there's a link I put there um, startmyweeklyemail.com. And literally, if you go there, you can see every email I did every week since November. So every year, every month, every week this year, and, you know, two months, you know, last two months last year, you can see every email I did. And you can actually use the exact template. It's right there. Um, but go there. Go there and look at the emails I sent. Look at how I 
create them and the message that I put um, and get ideas and, and use that. But yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a bulk email that goes out to everyone. However, they get a little Ricky in there and that's what, that's what wins. If you're not giving them a little bit of you and what's on your mind, then you're going to blend in with the rest of the agents and it's not going to stand out versus if you are doing this every week, right? Every week on the same day of the week, it shows consistency, dependability, hard work, professionalism, knowledgeable. You're, it's showing them that you're everything they want in an agent. It does all the heavy lifting for you. And if you're giving them your opinions on stuff, they're going to continue to tune in. And uh, that's what's going to help you stand out, you know, amongst the crowd of agents out there. Okay. Thank you. With content and actually create, creating the emails. And do you do it a week in advance and schedule them or do you click it live? Like, do you write it and then hit send? I normally write it and send it. So I do it every Wednesday. So I'm traveling to Sacramento tomorrow to do an event. So I'm going to do it this afternoon to go out in the morning this week. But normally I do it the day that I'm sending it. And so I just, I come up with the content right there on the spot. I may do a little research in my MLS. I may Google real estate in my area, look for some information. It just depends on what I want to say. But you can, like I say, you guys can go back and look at all the emails I did every single week and see how how I lay it all out. Do you think Wednesday's the best day? Is there a I think you, why you picked Wednesday? I think any day that you want to do it. It's kind of like when's the best time to make calls, whatever you want. Um, there's not like a best time. Um, the trick, Sally, is that it's the same day every week. When you show that consistency on the same day every week, they're like, wow, now this is, this is real. If you're doing those once a month emails, you're, you're losing market share to me. If you're doing the generic ones that companies send out for you, you're definitely not going to win any business out of that, right? When you sit down your prospects, the way they spell value is T-I-M-E. When they re read your email and they realize you spent time on this, they're going to be like, wow, right? And it's every week on the money, good content. They're like, wow, 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 wow. This is my agent when I decide to do something. This is a safety net on the back of your business. Like buyers ghost you. Four years ago, you never took them off the email. They call you four years later and say, hey, remember me? I'm like, yeah, I remember you, dipshit. And they're like, I want to buy this. I'm like, great, let's go buy it. Happens so many times. We just sold, the very first property I sold in 2008 was a condo on the beach for 200000 And very first, when I came back in the business, and we just listed and sold it last year, and uh, that was in 2008. So this is, what, 14, 15 years later? And um, never called and checked on her or anything. She got the weekly email. She called us when she was ready to go. And we listed and sold it. Um, it does all the heavy lifting for you. It's the glue. It's the glue that holds your business together. You said that you don't worry about remembering the your client information why is yeah. that why do i need to remember it personal touch give me an example your mother died uh, well i mean i guess if it comes up in conversation but how's your um how's your how was the graduation a good startup conversation that's that's how i think but i don't need that i can say i can say how's it going what's new same thing same effect the fact that I'm calling them is is the big kicker, not that I remember their daughter's graduation. So here, here's the thing, Olga, with that. Every single second counts. So if I'm spending just 30 minutes a week, just 30, filling out information in a CRM that my client does not care if I remember or not, that's 26 hours a year working hours. You know how much I can get done in 26 hours? See, people think, oh, it's just 30 minutes. No, it's 26 hours a year that you could have done serious, serious damage doing other activities that your clients actually care about. 
Now let's up it to an hour and let's say 52 hours a year. That could be the difference in you doubling or tripling your business for real, for real. And we're spending it, inputting information into a CRM once, once a week for an hour that our client that will never, information we will never use. Right. right? So although I think that would be cool and awesome and they would probably love us even more or something if we remembered their kids, their kids graduation, I can't find the ROI on the time lost in putting all that information to remember it because I could have tripled my business without even knowing any of that stuff. See what I'm saying? So for me, it's a give and take. Am I willing to sacrifice knowing every last detail of my client that they don't, they don't even care that I remember to triple my business? Or do I want to make sure I remember what somebody's dog's birthday is so that hopefully they still love me even though they would have anyway? You see, the real kicker between... For me, the real kicker of people loving me forever was the service I gave them during the deal. Answer the phone every time they call, right? Everything that they ask for, it's on the money. They get what they ask for. If I said I was going to do something, I did it right then and got it to them. And it was just, everything was like, if I can make the transaction so smooth for them, then they're like, I'm never going to use another agent because I don't want to risk not having this kind of service, knowing for a fact that this is going to go smooth and that Ricky's going to take care of this situation for me. That's what matters to them the most, right? If you remember the dog's birthday and then do a shitty job when the deal comes around, then, right, doesn't matter. But if I don't remember that dog's birthday and give them great service when the deal's happening, they're never going to use another agent. See what I'm saying? Perfect sense. Yep. If their mom died five months ago, then I'm not going to forget that about them. It just happened. Right? Sorry for your loss. Five years from now, they're not going to want me to bring it up. That's a sore subject. I don't need to remember that at that point. See what I'm saying? No, I was just going to say, like, I like every second counts for me. Right? It It, it matters so much. So like the things I put in the CRM are not the people's parents dying or anything like that, but it's like, how much are they pre-approved for? Maybe they, we need to come back and circle around in three months, uh, tasks, things like that. So what do you suggest with that? Because I can, that's part of, that's part of my pipe. That's part of my pipeline that I was talking to Olga about. And the very first question, right? You need 15 to 20 active buyers and sellers to close one deal a week, right? Mm -hmm. You need 25 plus to close two deals a week. I know this because I closed two deals a week for eight years in a row. And I've coached agents who close two deals a week. I've, I've coached agents who close one deal a week. This is not a theory. This is simple math. If you have 15 to 20 active buyers and sellers, then you're going to close one deal a week. If you have 25 plus, you're going to close two deals a week. Simple math. So for that pipeline of those 15 to 20 active buyers and sellers, which is what you're talking about, I've got a Google sheet for that. You've, you've got to keep those 15 to you've got to keep those 15 to 20 act the active buyers and sellers you've got to keep them somewhere and keep up with where you are in the transaction right um, but outside of that people that aren't going to do anything for two three years or ever I don't need to remember anything they can just get my weekly email and call me when they're ready I I only have so much mental capacity. I got time. I, I really have a, a call I have to get on literally in just a second. So, Yamil, did you have a question? Um, yes. My daughter um, just purchased a house in Sebastian, Florida for 246 cash. And we want to make, she's asking me for help, help her to make uh, um, how should we go in order to paint carpet? Um, the kitchen is okay. So I, there is so many things that she has to do at the house. Well, not so many, but to make available for the people that, that is going to buy. My question for you is what should I fix first in the house, um, uh, that make the house beauty for the new buyers in order to make the most out of the house. I don't know if I, I don't know if should we fix the kitchen or the bathroom. Or yeah. The 
So your daughter bought a house for 246 cash and she's going to fix it up and flip it. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know because I haven't seen the house and I don't know the comps and I don't know. There's too many variables for me to say what you should do. I don't know how maybe the kitchen would work. I don't know. Maybe it's dated, but it would work. Maybe it's just too old and needs to be totally torn out. I, I have no idea. I have to know what I can resell it for based on if it's fixed up. Um, and then start trying to backtrack how much my budget is to try to fix this house up to get it to that price level based on what I want my profit to be. So I can't answer that. I have no idea. I'd have to see the house and understand the neighborhood and the comps. You know what I mean? Um, yes. Yes, I understand that. But the house is... I mean, call me. We can talk about this later. We can but thank you for your time. And we do want to respect it. Thank, thank you for everything. Thank you. Oh, yeah. This is 11 o'clock. Thank you. Uh, it's Ricky. Yeah, good thank Good you. to see you guys. Good to see you guys. We'll thank talk to you, you soon. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.